All right, so there's some reviews we do on the channel that are more exciting than others, some that I get personally more excited about than others. I can tell you right now, this is one review I have been itching to do since I picked up the M1 carbine. Can't wait to bring you everything I know about it, uh, how it shoots, pros and cons, uh, shooting, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to answer a question. And the question is, would I carry this gun in World War II? Of course, if I lived back in, you know, if I lived back then, given the choice, would this be a primary gun that I would carry in World War II? That's the question I'm going to ask. Of course, I'll ask you guys the same thing after the video. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think about the M1 carbine and if, if, if it's something that you would carry in World War II if given the chance. But what I call this gun, the original PDW, pretty much the AR-15 of World War II, I think is a, a better fitment uh, as far as naming because this gun pretty much was that in a time where there wasn't a whole lot of guns like this around. So very excited about this. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. We got the grand on the table just as a, as a little bit of a reference. Uh, got some ammo, magazines here. Of course, everything's safety checked and, and we're all good to go there. But let's go ahead and get started with some specs here really quick on the M1 carbine. And I'm going to take that out for just a second. So what the military was trying to get is a basically a gun to replace not the Garand but the 45. They needed something for the support troops and drivers and, and and just people behind the lines that was a little bit more effective than the 45 caliber. All right, not only the pistol but the effective range as well. So, you know, several manufacturers, including John Guerin, actually uh, submitted a prototype for a carbine type rifle of his own. I think it was like the, the light grand or something like that. But there was a lot of manufacturers that, that tried to get in on this and uh, it ended up being Winchester's design that eventually won out. So what we have here is a five and a half pound rifle. They were shooting for five pounds, but it was a little bit heavier. But a five pound rifle at that time especially when you pick up something like the Grand, is very impressive. And even still today, this is a very well-balanced firearm and super light. I mean, there's not even AR-15s right now in our age that can get to that five-pound mark. And you're talking about advanced, you know, aluminum and, and all that kind of stuff that goes on today. We're talking about steel and wood <laughs> at five and a half pounds in the 40s. So pretty impressive. Uh, overall length 35.6 inches and a barrel length of 18 inches the round itself although you know some people that carried it didn't have as an effective uh, stopping power as they would hoped but actually most people that carried and used this weapon in self-defense really liked it especially inside of 100 yards uh, the round today you can still find it. It's pretty pricey. They carry a couple different types. I think there's a uh, there's a new round they're making. Like uh, Iraq Veteran 88, 88 did uh, did some testing with that new ammunition. So they're still making it, and it's it's basically compared to 357 Magnum uh, velocities and, and and effectiveness. But of course, you're talking about a much longer distances. This round can actually uh, can actually be effective like that. And from what most people say as far as their research, inside of 200 yards is where this gun really shines. Once you get past 200, the bullet drop and velocity of the round just is, is, is too much of a fall off. But you can uh, have this gun out to 300 yards according to your, to your ramp style sight. You know, it has an adjustment for that. But um, So basically, like I said, this gun was designed not as a replacement to the Grand, but as a replacement for the 1911. You're looking at the M1 version right here. This is an Inland Manufacturing, which was a division of General Motors at the time. So everybody, literally everybody in, the, uh, in, in that time period in World War II had a part in helping the war effort. So what I want to show you right here, and I'm going to show you some pictures too because I know this stuff can be kind of hard to see on the fly, but we took all kinds of detailed pictures, so don't worry. But what this says right here is Inland Manufacturing Division of General Motors, uh, 9 of 43. All right, so they made these things essentially from 1941 to 1945, and you had 
10 manufacturers, but basically there was only nine manufacturers that actually uh, had guns that were produced and accepted. And we'll get into that a little bit, you know, here in a little bit. Uh, let's talk about some of the features here. We'll walk you around the gun and then we'll talk a little bit more about, about some of these features. You have your barrel band right here. This is the Type 3, okay, where they added the bayonet lug. Uh, very few bayonet lugs uh, were ever used in World War II. That was mainly Korea and Vietnam. But pretty much all of them were outfitted with the, uh, with the uh, bayonet lug style uh, barrel band that's attached to the barrel band, I should say, um, during the refurbishment process after World War II. You have a sling attachment right there. Uh, there's all different types of parts they used on this gun. There was like rolling changes all the time. So I'm not going to cover every single one of those. There's a lot of good information out there. I'm just going to kind of give you some of the main things on this specific rifle. Now, one thing I will go ahead and point out, if you are a carbine expert or you know these guns at all, you're probably thinking, well, where's your rivets? Well, this is a point of contention <laughs> with this gun. I, I know this is a reproduction stock of some kind, but I just don't know from how long ago. I am pretty sure, and, and I, I would take a guess that it's from the 50s because you can see how the wood has patinaed there. All right, so it's been on there a long time, but there was never any, as far as I know, there was never any issued standard issued uh, handguard that did not have the rivets in there. And I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about because I bought a Korean War era style. And you can see right there how you have four rivets that hold in this little plate. Turn it underneath, you can see how the rivets hold in the little plate where it butts up to the receiver. All right, this stock does not have that. I assume it's a reproduction, but it's an old reproduction because I don't see anything that's new that's even close to this all right but it's a nice looking stock i will say that um i'm pretty sure this is a reproduction sling as well i believe from the same era from the 50s but it still looks pretty good the original ones were more like a khaki color that you see on the grand right there that's a repro as well but that's more traditional uh style coming back 15 round magazines these were standard during world war ii they did have the 30 round magazines available during world war ii but pretty much none of them were used. They did have the uh, M2 version, which is the select fire. So the M2 version was actually out. Uh, it was produced during World War II, and that was an answer to the Sturmgewehr. When we seen the Sturmgewehr, which was pretty much the first assault rifle, you know, a light round that moves really fast, high capacity, we needed something to combat that. But fortunately, that was towards the end of the war, and the M2s... As far as I know, really never seen the front lines, and, and that's a good thing. So coming back, you have 15-round magazines as standard for World War II. Uh, this one even has the original push-button style safety. So I'm going to flip this around here. So the original carbines, you had Type 1, Type 2, Type 3. This is a Type 3, and basically the difference is you have ones that are um, serrated. This one is not serrated. And then you have little differences on how this safety actually engages in one position or another. And it's kind of like a divot like this that piece rides into. And this is a Type 3 push button safety, which from doing my research, this gun, this serial number, should have that safety. Although most of them were retrofitted with the uh, rotary style safeties that you see on a lot of, a lot of them, um, this one originally had the push button style type three it was never changed which is pretty cool and the reason they changed that it, it's pretty obvious just looking at it from here you have it so close to the magazine release gis were pushing the safety or pushing what they thought was the safety and it was the magazine magazine dropping the dirt you know and their safety's still on i mean it was just a bad deal so they and i even caught myself doing it during shooting i would you know go to hit that or hit the magazine release or one or the other so they changed it to the rotary but it's cool that this one still has that uh bolt right here so you have a rotating bolt similar to the grand that and the butt plate screw are the only similarities between this and the grand it is not a small grand okay just want to point that out 
but you have your rotating bolt here. There's your extractor and you'll see how this works. It uncams at that point, comes back, bolt rotates. All right, strips around off, new one is locked into place. All right, very intuitive design. The Mini 14 is set up like this, more like the Grand, but you know, with that rotating bolt style. Now this one is the flat bolt. They switched to the round bolt mainly for production purposes. Uh, they made it a little bit stronger, a little bit better lockup. They made the round bolts a little bit longer, so there was less chance of this firing out of battery. The round bolt was not made for the Select Fire M2. Okay, that's a pretty big misconception, but that is not the case. All right, both of these were acceptable. The round bolt was just an improvement upon this. All right, uh, you can see, again, we'll take pictures for you guys, but it's a U.S. Carbine Caliber 30 M1. That was the official name, United States Carbine Caliber 30 M1. We call it the M1 Carbine, of course. All right, receiver back here. You have your ramp style sight. These were originally flip-ups. All right, but they changed these during the refurbishment process to the ramp style. The original flip-ups, it was 100 and 200. That was it. This gives you options between 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. So a lot more options. All right, you have a windage adjustment on this one as well, which the original one did not. So that's pretty cool. And then, of course, you have your serial number back here in the back with inland division underneath but when they change to these ramp styles it's really hard to see the manufacturer on the original ones you could see all of that but on these you really cannot all right so pretty nice looking gun you have your oil or here all right the original ones had an eye cut with or the eye cut in the uh wood for the oiler with a high wood and then you had the oval cut with the high wood, which is what this one is. And then you had the oval cut with the low wood, so you could see more of the op rod. And I and there was a reason they did that, but I don't remember what it was. If you remember what it was, leave me a comment down below. Uh, but one interesting thing about the way this bolt rides, there's a spring in here. And I'm going to break this gun down for you just a little bit, just so you can kind of see how this thing works. But uh, this is one of the smoothest bolts and actions I have ever used on any kind of firearm. It really is. Uh, so it's it's really impressive. And like I said, everything on this gun, except for the magazines, of course, um, everything on this gun, except for the stock and the sling, is pretty much all original to this specific serial number. And there's some really great uh, websites to plug your serial number in and compare it to the type of parts that should be on the gun. So this is a an original uh, U.S. magazine pouch. It's actually dated 1943, the same as the gun, which is pretty cool. And I ended up picking one of these up because a lot of GIs figured out very quickly that by putting this on the stock, you had two extra magazines there that you could carry on the stock and it was a lot easier to get to. Um, so very cool little accessory. And I believe I got that from legacy, um, collectible. No, where was it? No, I, I, I got it from Liberty tree, uh, collectors is where I got that, uh, that piece from. So overall, man, the gun has a lot of cool features on it and it served a very specific purpose. And from what I know, it served that purpose very well. So you have the short stroke gas system. Velocities, like I said, they're similar to a 357 Magnum. Uh, you have 100, uh, you know, your standard cartridge is 110 grain, moving at right under 2,000 feet per second and 967 foot pounds of energy. Uh, 15 or 30 round magazines. I opted for the 15 because I wanted to kind of, I just wanted to keep this more original to what it was in World War II. Um, and, you know, not only was this a replacement for the 1911, but it was a cheaper option than the uh, Thompson submachine gun. Of course, the Thompson, it fired a 45 caliber cartridge, but it did not have the effective range like this gun and like that cartridge. But it was also very expensive to manufacture. I mean, you're talking about the M1 carbine was 45 bucks to manufacture back then compared to two and a quarter for the Thompson machine gun. And not only that, the Thompson machine gun was just more complicated than this gun. I believe these guns have 50 parts. That's it. 
And it was a collaboration uh, between David uh, Marshall, Carbine, Williams, and, you know, it kind of had his gas system in there. Of course, he was famous for uh, doing time in jail for murder, and he was working on a firearm while he was in jail and all of that. And then he had the Winchester 1905 rifle uh, trigger group, and then the rotating bolt like the Grand. So it was a kind of combination of all of those things. A couple more interesting things here before we break the gun down. Um, this cartridge was non-corrosive. It had non-corrosive primers. And at that time, that was a pretty big deal. I mean, the Grands were using corrosive ammunition and it was eating the barrels out of those things. So I think that, you know, leads to the fact why we have these original barrels still because of the non-corrosive primers that they were using in the ammunition, which is really good for us and, and good for those guys as well. Because if you use corrosive ammo and a gun like this with this gas system, it would have it would have clogged the gun up almost immediately. So that was that was something good that they did. And this was the most produced gun of World War II. All right. Something that for something that did not even was not even supposed to hit the front lines, although a lot of these did. It was for support troops and, and, and that kind of thing. It ended up being the most produced gun in World War II. Over 6.2 million of these guns were produced. So you might be thinking, well, all right, so Winchester produced a lot of them and Lynn produced them. We literally had every company we could get on board making these guns. You ever heard of IBM? I'm sure you have. They were making uh, M1 carbines. So basically anybody that had the tooling to make these guns, we got them on board. Saginaw, they were a steering gear company for GM. They were making them. Inland, of course, the division of GM, they were making them. Uh, you had, let's see, Erwin Peterson. They made 3,542 that were not accepted, and I believe that company was actually, or those guns were given to Saginaw, and Saginaw uh, took over production then. Um, Underwood, all right? Let's go through some of these numbers here really quick because this is interesting, all right? Just, just bear with me here. So you had Inland that made 2,632,097. Now, Inland was the only producer of the M1A, which has the foldable stock. That was really for paratroopers and, and those guys that needed something really small and compact. You had, let's see, also Inland made the M2 as well. So that's all of their numbers with the M1, the M1A, and the M2. 2,632,097. You had Winchester with 828,059. They also made the M2, and they were the only one with previous weapons manufacturer experience. All right, all these other companies never made weapons before. We talked about Erwin Peterson, their 3,542 that were not accepted but given to Saginaw. Uh, Saginaw, of course, total 517,213. Underwood, 545,616. Um, and let's see, National Poster Meter, all right, 413,017. They actually changed their name uh, towards the end of production to Commercial Controls Corporation that made 239 from leftover parts. By that time, ceased production. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't need the guns at that time. Uh, quality hardware manufacturing, 359,666. IBM, 346,500. Standard products, 247,100 M1 carbines made. So what if you gave somebody um, uh, in the war, you know, an IBM typewriter and an IBM M1 carbine? I mean, it was that crazy. You know, we had so many companies that we needed their tooling, we needed them to, and some of these companies didn't have the tooling. They had no employees. I mean, so th this was a big time effort, and obviously for good reasons, we needed a lot of companies to pump out parts. But it wasn't just the companies building entire rifles. You know, some companies did not make their own barrels. All right, maybe Underwood made the barrels for them, or Winchester, or whoever, all of the parts were designed to be interchangeable with the, with the next manufacturer. And when these manufacturers turned in their guns, they didn't just turn in guns. They had to turn in a certain amount of spare parts to go with them. 
trigger groups and barrels and everything else. All right. So it was a big time effort uh, with a lot of companies, a lot of hands going into this. And these are really just the prime contractors I'm giving you. There were probably hundreds of subcontractors working on other little things for this gun. So a very impressive effort. And in four years, over 6 million made, of course, including the M1A and the, uh, and the M2 versions. But man, they were pumping these things out. All right, so if you guys were hoping for a short review, you're not going to get it here. All right, this is not a commercial. This is not trying to sell you an M1 carbine. This is me just falling in love with the history and everything that goes into this gun. So if you wanted a short review, go somewhere else. But this is for people that want to know more about this gun. And we're, we're just getting started, man. So uh, stick with me here. We're about to get to the shooting right now, what I'd like to show you is the breakdown all right now it's not recommended to do this a whole lot you don't want to affect the accuracy but it's it's really easy to do this uh this barrel band screw here all right you don't want to over tighten that and basically we just want to loosen it enough all right where we can pop this down just a little bit with this barrel band retainer me trying to do it on camera I've done it a couple times already so all right slides up just like that this gun is so easy to take apart the grand's easy too really handguard comes up like that you can see again this one just has two screws from underneath not a standard issue thing again if you guys know anything about this stock please let me know I'm about to show you a couple of markings here and then what we're gonna do move this up a little bit we're going to take this one screw right here and we're going to undo this. I think that'll be enough to actually get the barrel assembly out of there. Let's see. Nope, not yet. So we'll just undo this screw. way pull it out there oh, oh, it's not going to come out with the magazine in there duh all right and what you'll see here is oi now this was a common designation on the inland stocks all right over 10 made the stocks for inland all right but this looks this doesn't look right for the time period okay a lot of those were rolled or however they did it in the wood it wasn't looked like it was it was just written on again look at the patina on this gun this thing has been on here for a very long time um even this shrouded area right here where the uh, uh where the gas block and all that butts up to here it doesn't it's not right for the time period again i'm not passing it off as something like that and it wasn't passed off to me like that but it's very interesting, like where did this stock come from? And I think that's one of the, the, the most intriguing parts of these firearms is just, you know, what's the history? Who held it? Who used it? Whose life did this protect? Who picked this gun up and, and took it home with them? I mean, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff. Your imagination just takes over. But uh, again, don't know where the stock came from, but it's very cool to kind of just to see it. I, I, I don't know. All right. But. All right, you have a proof marking here, all right, and then you also have a proof marking here, all right, you can see your short stroke gas system, all right, with your uh, recoil spring and guide rod there, all right, you can see how that works, there's your, you can get a pointer of some kind, all right, here's your gas system, you basically have a port, all right, in the barrel that pushes gas with the, uh, with the gas piston, and it pushes the op rod that way, whenever the round is is going through the barrel all right so very ingenious design and again this is so such a smooth firearm um, not only controls but shooting it which you're about to see here in a minute uh, you can see your trigger return spring and your hammer you can't really see your hammer but your hammer's right here and you can see how that bolt all right check out this area right here i'll try to hold it from this side so you guys can see but it, Knocks your hammer back down, re-engages it, 
and then it's ready to fire again. All right. So very cool, very easy to clean. And one thing that I've heard, I was watching a video on forgotten weapons and, and those guys are awesome, man. They know, <laughs> I mean, they, that guy knows his stuff, man. They all do. But I was watching a video about the M1 carbine and the reliability of the M1 carbine. And, uh, you know, he was saying that these guns were actually really reliable, but you had to run them wet. You had to keep them lubed up. Um, you never wanted to run these guns dry. All right. So it's very easy to keep this gun well maintained. And what you'll see on the back of the receiver there is a little hook and that just hooks underneath your, your piece right here. So let me slide it in like that and it drops back down into place. And I spent a few hours up here when I first got the gun trying to figure out all these parts, seeing what was correct, what wasn't. And uh, that, was a, that was actually a pretty fun part of this whole process as well. So let's slide that in there. I'm going to slide the barrel band back over the retainer there. Make sure it clicks into place. All right. Had to get that clicked into place off camera. It's not hard to do. It's just kind of awkward doing it like this. And I'm going to tighten this back up. Again, you don't want to over tighten this barrel band. Um, this, this barrel band in, in, in particular really led to an increase in accuracy. But you don't want to over tighten it because you can lead to cracking the stock. And the way they redesigned some of these stocks, they made this part a little bit longer, which reinforced it. But again, I don't know where this stock is from or how old it is or any of that. So I'm just going to tighten it down. About to right there. All right. So, man, we covered a lot. We still have to do shooting, pros and cons. This is a fun video. I'm excited about this. I'm going to show you some issues that we did have with the gun. Then we'll come back, talk about pros and cons. And I'll tell you, if I would carry the M1 carbine in combat, if I was in World War II, we'll see you guys in a minute. Glasses are fogging up. change right there on the table in front of you Germans incoming Germans incoming 80 yards nice spin <laughs>
better. 80 yards, 80 yards. Target out way out there. Way out there. Hit the target, he's gonna kill you. There you go, you got him. Oh, nice shooting. Mag change, right there on the table in front of you. Germans incoming, Germans incoming. 80 yards. Nice, spin him. Uh oh, I got a jam. Let it go forward, there you go. Nice. Good shooting. Lean forward. A little bit. There you go. Alright, so hopefully you guys enjoy that, man. I, I know we enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed watching it. Although this ammunition is expensive to shoot, it's one of those guns, when we took it to the range, it was the gun that people loved to shoot. My son loved it, Mrs. Heckshot loved it, and I loved it, alright? If you just want to stop watching the video right there, there's my answer. I love this gun. It does have some caveats, and we did have a couple of issues and a couple of stoppages. But I think they were pretty much all magazine related. And before we do the trigger here, I want to show you something. On this specific magazine, the base plate kept sliding forward. All right. Now, this is the magazine that came with the gun. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to replicate this. But as you would go through the rounds in the mag, this base plate would just slide forward. Okay. And I heard this is a weakness of the M1 carbine. Even back then, you know, GIs would say that their M1 carbines, they love the gun, but whenever they would get a new shipment of magazines, they would throw the old ones away. They pretty much seen these as expendable, and that's something in that Forgotten Weapons video I learned as well. So the magazines were the biggest problem with the gun. When they would get new ones, they would throw the old ones out. These two right here were original World War II magazines. They were kind of pricey. I think they were about 40 bucks each. Still in the wax paper. So it was new old stock. And on Patreon, we actually took these and unwrapped them for you guys over there. Uh, a lot of this stuff we're doing on Patreon. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys now, we have a ton of extra content on this gun, that gun, a bunch of guns over there. If you want to support us for a buck, you get a ton of content. So please come over there and check out what we're doing on Patreon. But we unwrapped these on Patreon from the wax paper and the bluing and everything on these is perfect. And when we use these magazines, no stoppages. <laughs> so, so the magazine was probably the biggest issue with stoppages in this gun. Otherwise, the guns ran really, really well. All right. Cold, there were some issues with cold, uh, you know, some, some issues there. Uh, but there's even been tests done since then in cold environments uh, where these guns do really well. So I think... Accuracy is amazing on this gun, um, and the little bit of issues we had, again, I believe it's all in this one magazine that we had the issue with, all right? So shooting overall went very well, um, and it was cool too. We got to shoot our plates up close because it's pretty much a pistol caliber type of carbine, so we were able to shoot the plates up close and, and, and do some testing with that too, trying to get some, you know, some quicker shots. The sight picture, of course, on this gun it's going to be really hard to show you on camera. You're not going to see a whole lot. You have a blade here in the front. It's, of course, protected, all right, on both sides. 
and then you have a peephole sight in the rear. Very similar to the Grand, not as easy to pick up as the Grand, but I had this set at 100 yards, and this thing was just on point all the time. But there's not a whole lot of contrast there, so I could see where maybe GIs had an issue picking that up, you know, lower light or, you know, early in the morning, late at night, dark targets, you know, that could, that could be a little bit troublesome, I'm sure. So let's show you the trigger, the weight, and then we'll talk about pros and cons and uses of the gun. So the trigger here, it's actually really, really good. All right, let me turn the safety off. All right, hear that snap. Reset. All right, a little bit clunky, but overall, not too bad at all. What's it testing at weight wise? Let's find out. I have not pulled this one yet at all. Yeah, let's reset it here. Six pounds, 14 ounces. Six pounds, 15 ounces. So right under seven pounds. Doesn't feel like that though, man. It feels really nice, especially for the time period. So shooting with good, very fun to shoot, very light, you know, especially when you compare it to the Grand. It's like two totally different guns. Uh, recoil is so manageable. I mean, even for a new shooter, as long as they can reach, you know, my youngest son, he had an issue because there's, you know, there's no collapsible or adjustable stock here. It is what it is. Um, he had an issue trying to reach the trigger. All right. You have this semi pistol grip here, very comfortable to hold, but as long as they can reach, anybody can shoot this gun and shoot it accurately and have an amazing time at the range. And that leads us into uses. What is this gun good for today? Well, obviously collectors. I mean, there's so many different manufacturers. You could have one from Underwood, IBM, Rockola. I don't even think we mentioned Rockola. Rockola made these things too, by the way. Um, you could have one from Inland. You could have one from each manufacturer. Or maybe you have a Winchester gun and you want to get a Winchester. There was like a rare one where Saginaw made the trigger group. And you, I mean... The, the possibilities are endless and thank God they didn't destroy these rifles or they didn't destroy a whole lot of them um, and we can still enjoy these today. So collector's piece is number one. Uh, number two is a range gun with a caveat that ammo is expensive. So I'm just letting you know now, I think a box of 50, 25, 30 bucks. All right. So 50 set around, it's pretty expensive, but damn, it's fun to shoot. Um, and a hunting rifle, all right? If your state allows it, of course. There are some states that won't allow you to hunt with a 30 carbine, uh, but for small game, deer, or varmints, uh, whatever, anything like that, you can you can take uh, you can take pretty decent sized game with a gun like this, all right? Let's talk about pros and cons. And I think we've hit on a few of these here, but overall, I'd say probably, this was just an awesome support troop gun i mean it really was very light very easy to manage the magazines the gun everything is balanced very, very well accuracy was fantastic um the options on the guns there's some new manufacturers that make these guns too i'll go ahead and throw this out here i haven't seen a whole lot of good things on the new ones maybe they've improved over the past couple of years i don't know if you were to buy one of these, I think I got this one for around eight fifty. Okay, it was a, it was a it was a used gun. All right, obviously, um, but it was on consignment at a local shop. All right, if you're gonna buy one of these, buy one of the ones that has some character, has some soul, that's been there and done that literally. Uh, just be careful when you go to buy these because a lot of people will fake certain markings to get more money. I mean, literally having one proof mark or having one rare Winchester marking or anything like that, you know, especially maybe the 239 that were made, anything like that is going to add such a big premium. You just want to do your homework on a gun. Don't, don't just rush out and buy that. I, I did not buy this. I did not just rush out and buy this. Whenever I got sent the information, I had the, the dealer send me the, the serial number and everything on this gun. And I spent time researching every little thing. 
I knew the stock wasn't original, but I knew everything else was for the most part. I didn't get inside the gun, but I did what I could on the outside. And I thought for 800 bucks, that's a pretty good deal. And I'll take a, I'll take a chance on it. And I'm glad I did. Okay. But most of the time when I see these are a thousand, 1200 and on up, if you get an M1A, they're like $5,000. I mean, those, you know, those, but those are pretty, a little bit more rare, but this is what I'm trying to get at. Um, just take your time. If you're going to buy one, I would say get one from World War II, Korea. You know, well, they were only made during World War II, but you know what I'm saying. Get one that has some soul. Uh, sight picture on this gun is actually decent. Magazine capacity, you got to think. 1945, you have a 7 round 1911 or a 15 round 30 carbine. I'm going to take this. More rounds, better chances of, of, of stopping a threat, that's for sure. Um, overall, it's just cool. I mean, light, easy to shoot, effective, multiple uses. Uh, to me, this gun just, it, and it's so classy, man. I just love the way this thing looks and it feels. Uh, it's just an awesome little gun. All right, and there were a few cons. I think one con that we have to mention here is the magazines, all right? The finicky nature of these magazines, once they get worn out, pretty much expendable and we had some issues with those all right the magazines are expensive the ammo is expensive the guns generally are pretty expensive i mean not everybody has a thousand dollars to just go out and buy on a gun all right so they are pricey but you know for something that you know it was 45 dollars to produce back then so the price has gone up a bit you could say i mean but it's it's just one of those things, you know, it's like anything that's valuable and there's less and less of every single year, uh, they're going to go up in price. Uh, the sight picture is not the best. You don't have very, the best contrast there. Um, and there's no length of pull adjustment. Now this is coming from a current age perspective. You know, there's no length of pull adjustment. The butt stock isn't the best, but you know, I look at it like this. These guys weren't going for straight comfort they were going for effectiveness and what is going to help us win this war that's what they're going for and when you look at it like that you're like eh, okay i can deal with that i can deal with the fact there's no length of pull i can deal with the fact the sights kind of suck in low light um yeah it's smooth it's a classy gun to me i wouldn't even look twice at a new production m1 carbine i'd go with one of the uh one of the original you know, World War II guns, but that's just me, of course. Um, so there's your cons. And what about the question I asked at the beginning of the video? Would I carry this gun given the chance in World War II? And I would say, yeah, as long as I had a bunch of magazines on me, you know, if I'm a support troop, I'm not worried about taking shots at two, three, 400 yards, maybe 200 yards, but not three, four, 500 yards. And even in World War II, the fighting wasn't like that anyways. We already realized that at that point, you know, thousand yard shots, thousand meter shots at that time, that kind of fighting was over with. I mean, it was, it was up close and dirty within a hundred yards most of the time. So absolutely I would have taken this gun. I mean, it's going to have seven more rounds than the Garand. Although if I want to stop somebody, that Garand round is just no comparison. But if I'm a support troop, I, I'm definitely taking this. And maybe even if I'm on the front line, I might take this gun because it's just so maneuverable. It's very light. I can carry a bunch of ammo and I would feel adequately armed with the M1 carbine. I think this gun is absolutely the coolest, one of the coolest and one of my favorite guns already is the M1 carbine. Can I get an M2 carbine? <laughs> Probably not. Those are select fire and impossible to get uh, with regulations and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'll definitely take the M1 carbine. And you know what else is cool about this gun? It was actually an issued gun and there's been no modifications. You know, you gotta look at these two guns. These are some of the last gun or the last generation of guns where we can actually own what the GI's own without all the bull crap, uh, you know, modifications to make it legal. These guns are legal and they were issued to our men and women that served back then 
it's just incredible, man. I love it. Absolutely love it. And absolutely would carry one if given the chance back then. Of course, I want to know what you guys have to say about the M1 carbine. Uh, give me all your opinions, thoughts on this gun. Check us out on Patreon. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in the next one. And as always, hold them down.